Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll take a closer look at the new Apple Data Center in Mesa, and we'll see how drone technology is raising concerns over privacy issues. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The new Apple Command Center in Mesa was touted as a plus for Arizona by Governor Doug Ducey and others at a press conference Monday. A three million square foot facility in Mesa, Arizona. It means 300 to 500 construction and trade jobs and 150 permanent Apple jobs. It means an investment in clean energy with projects that will eventually produce enough solar energy to power 15,000 homes. In all, it means a $2 billion investment with a 30-year commitment to the state of Arizona. But there are some concerns amid the celebrations over the new high-tech facility. And joining us tonight is former Mesa City Councilman Scott Summers. Also, we welcome economist Elliot Pollack of Elliot D. Pollack and Company. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. This is, uh, what is exactly Apple doing with this site? Well, Apple uh, intends to use this site largely for a data center. We've seen several data centers be built uh, in the Phoenix metro area. I think eBay built one. Uh, not too long ago, it employs about 20 people. And it, so it's basically the Global Command Center, it's a data storage facility, isn't it? It's a data storage facility. So every time you download something on iTunes or you upload something on your cell phone, it has to go somewhere. So this would be one of many facilities where it would right. be stored. Cloud storage, that it's, kind of that's thing. That's exactly what it is, cloud storage. Okay, and I guess companies can also, you know, they can store data, but they can run off-site software and this sort of thing there as well, I yes. imagine. Yeah. So, 150 full-time jobs, three to five, 600 maybe temporary yeah. construction jobs. Is this a good thing for Arizona? Well, there, the, the thing is that there's good and bad out of it. The good news is, from an economic de development standpoint, it's a real victory. Uh, it's something we can use marketing-wise. Uh, attracting Apple is a big deal. Uh, attracting Apple based on things related to the economic development package of the past a few years ago is a big deal. The fact that it shouldn't cost the state money to get them here. Uh, and it uses a facility that would have been nice to have full, but essentially has been vacant is a big deal. And there's a multiplier effect that 150 jobs really means about 325 jobs. The 300 construction jobs really means about 600 jobs. So in total, it means about 1,100 jobs over the next few years. And, and the, the jobs, the 150 jobs are, are high wage jobs. So it, it's got positives from my standpoint. And yet those 150 jobs, uh, the previous plan was for 700 some odd right. jobs. What happened to that previous plan? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we, we've taken a look at this area for a long time, we established a vision for it to create 100,000 high wage jobs in the area and we think that that is certainly, we can accomplish that. So this 150 jobs, that's, that's good. They meet the objective of that. Also having a data center meets the objective of the Elliott Road Technology Corridor that we put together in the fourth quarter last year. So hanging the Apple brand as one of the first uh, businesses to locate on that corridor is fantastic. There's there's a victory there, but it's 150 jobs, not 727 jobs. In addition, the data center just really doesn't have the expansion capability necessarily that uh, Apple would have with GT Technologies. There had been talk of expansion to 4,000 jobs over time if that had been a successful yeah. program. Un unfortunately, it hadn't been the, the, a successful program. First Solar would have created more jobs, but it never happened. Uh, the, the glass company would have created a lot more jobs, but it never happened. So we had an empty plant sitting there. And we were talking before, it might have, maybe you could have mothballed it and see what else you attracted, but this was a bird in the hand, and it was a very attractive bird in the hand from an economic development standpoint. But is the bird in the hand going to be a problem in the future in the sense of this maybe not be? I, you tell me, is this the best use for this kind of a facility? We, we don't know what the other use might have been. Yeah. That's the problem. So it's a bird in the hand versus two in the bush. And given the economic 
situation at the present time. I think the idea was we better get some jobs in here. Uh, we, we, the place needs to grow more. We need some high quality jobs. This meets the criteria. I will agree with Scott. It would have been nicer if there were more jobs, but there weren't. There weren't, but could there have been in the In other words, uh, could they have been a more patient? Could they have waited around a little longer? And that's what you wonder. When First Solar went under, there was no apple on the horizon for this facility. But what we have is 1.3 million square feet of brand new manufacturing ready to move in facility. Has power right across the street, has dark fiber, sewer streets, access to freeways. We don't have that kind of facility in Mesa for that fa mm -hmm. fact, really don't have a lot of that type of space in Arizona. I think the possibility it could have been quickly filled with a manufacturing facility, we did it once before, possibly we could have done it again, but it might have been mothballed, yeah. you don't and know. You, and that's the thing, it was, again, bird in the hand versus two in the bush. I agree with Scott, it would have been great. This is a, a huge facility, it's up to date, it's got everything that's needed for some type of high-tech manufacturing, but apparently nothing rolled in, and the decision that the people in Mesa and the politicians have to make is do we take what we can get, especially when it'll help us economic development-wise in terms of recruiting other companies, because Apple is a big deal, at least in the name, or do we just say, you know what, we're going to hold out because in, in an expansion, having ready move-in space is a big deal. Is, is there a psychological boost for an area, just, just basically saying someone wants us? Well, it's not only that someone wants us, it's a big name that wants us. And it's a, a big name that you can, you can try to market. Well, Apple moved here, and here's why, and here's what our economic development package did, did and here's what the tax situation is. And you, the, the economic development people should be able to make hay out of this one. Yeah, Please. And, and absolutely. I think when you hang Apple on, in any area, that says that you're open for business, and particularly for tech businesses. But Apple has said a lot of great things about Mesa yeah. and the state of Arizona when they did the, the first deal. Yeah. And now, uh, I think another benefit to this is you have uh, a new administration just came into office right. in January, and they got a, do a deal done in 48 hours. And I, I think it, the early sign for that is that you have a governor that's interested in economic development, making deals, making yes. sure that they work, and moving forward quickly yeah. on economic development. And that's development. a big deal because I think our present governor, unlike any other governor in the 50 years I've been a resident of Arizona, is all about business. He knows how business works. He knows what they think. He knows how to motivate them. He knows what they're looking for. And if he thinks it's a big deal, I'm willing to go along with that. But our data centers, are they magnets for other tech? Apple's a magnet, I, I, can, yes. I can see that. But a data center, we've seen these pop up around the country and they're just basically storing stuff for, I mean, these are, these are, these are glorified storage facilities. Is, is, yeah. is, is, is it the, could the facility have had more jobs in it? Certainly, the glass experience said that if you had a company that was successful, it could. Certainly, 10,000 square foot feet per employee, which is what they have, mm -hmm. seems like, you know, let's get serious. And, and so I think it was really a tough decision, but it was there. It was a Super Bowl weekend. There were a lot of executives around. Uh, and to show that we can attract something like that, from an economic development standpoint, it was a great victory. We will never know what else could have been there. But I will agree that to have user-ready space of any type, whether it's office, whether it's industrial, whether it's this manufacturing plant, in a, an expansion, uh, in, when the economy is expanding, is a positive because people like to move in right away. Right, and I believe data centers absolutely are appropriate to yes. the mix uh, in Arizona in general, but certainly in this technology mm -hmm. corridor. Uh, but we have to think and, beyond data centers because right. you mentioned one job for every 10,000 square foot of floor yeah. space. If you calculate that out roughly in my head, I would have to put 32 square miles yeah. under, under, under roof in order to have 100,000 thousand high wage jobs in this area. The whole area is only 54 square miles. Now that's, that's unrealistic, but certainly my concern with this particular deal is it's the one building, the one building that we had that, that could 
house manufacturing okay, so quickly. With, with that in mind, are we going to see more buildings perhaps built slightly on spec? I don't know if you can build something like that on spec, but are you going to see folks coming in and building on spec knowing that, well, they might just turn it into a data center? You don't build a building like this on spec. Or something, I don't mean no. a building like this, exactly. but something in the general territory. Are, yeah, will spec this, building this, take a hit? A million three spec building, not a chance. So other spec right. building will not take a hit either. No, it's smaller. But, but that doesn't mean that companies won't come in and build buildings like it that ho house more employees. Don't confuse this with call centers where the people are making just above minimum wage. These are clearly high wage jobs, which means the multiplier effect is greater than it would be if they weren't high wage jobs. Uh, so, okay, foreign trade zone applies here apparently. The energy tax breaks, it looks like the energy tax breaks will apply because it can be 100% renewable. Yeah. Is it worth that? Well, that's going to be the question is they finalize what the incentives are for this. Uh, I, I think we can get some investment in yeah. solar and renewable energies. Those are going to be worth it. Uh, the foreign trade zone does give me concern. It's really developed to help manufacturers and merchandisers who do international trade. I think it's a stretch to say this does any type of significant international trade. We only have 2,000 or so acres in Mesa to utilize 50 of it. Are, are being utilized here, so I'm concerned about that. Workforce development has been discussed. Uh, you know, for a, for a community of four million people with ASU, EVIT is up the road, you have uh, MCC is up the road. You have a lot of solid workforce. I don't think you need I, a lot of I will of tell incentive. you, I think it'll be a long, 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 long time till Mesa runs out of developable industrial land. They, they are, were very thoughtful and have a very large base uh, industrial base to build on. Uh, so so uh, to me that's not the issue as much as do you take the bird in the hand versus two in the bush and I just think the, that they want to get wanted to get something started. Clearly uh, the glass plant would have created more jobs except for one little thing the glass plant went bankrupt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exploded right. Okay General we got to stop right there. Thank you so much. Good conversation. Good to Thank have you. you both here. My pleasure. Drones, fake cell phone towers, license plate readers, all new technology that can negatively affect your right to privacy. And here to help explain what's out there and what it's watching and listening to is Attorney James Arrowwood of the Fruitkin Law Firm in Scottsdale. Welcome back to Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Uh, We'll start with drones and kind of take it from there. The privacy concerns, especially when it comes to commercial use or, or a, 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 a investigative use, these sorts of things, how much of a concern is that? Well, it, it kind of depends. It depends on whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, I think, partially. But people are justified in, in being concerned about their constitutional rights and, and the right to privacy. The technology has far outpaced the law. Law moves slowly. So we now have technology that's 20 or 30 years ahead of the law. Okay, so basically, and I, I was, as far, let's go to commercial use here just real quickly. How strict are the FAA rules for commercial use? Well, presently, the, the FAA has been very strict with issuing permits for commercial use or certificates of authorization. You've had to go through a lengthy process. They've been backlogged. There's not a good framework yet for commercial use, which prevents your average realtor, for instance, uh, where we could see a great use for this from using the, those kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. But really, there's a broader technological economy that's, that's at issue here, which is surveillance. And yes. for instance, a drone is just a bird. If it has no technology attached to it, it's, it's really just a model aircraft. So it has very little economic value until you put technology in it or attach technology to it. 
And that's what's really the issue, and that's what has people concerned. Yes. Are they right to be concerned? Well, I think in a sense, yeah, because there's not a, a good legal framework for how some of this technology is used. And it is absolutely being used. And I'm going to be careful about talking about what's called sources and methods. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of this information is what we call open source information, which means it's available publicly on the Internet with some, some research. Okay, But what the technology now does is it can intercept phone calls. Not just the fact that you're making a phone call, but it can intercept you speaking. Right. It can intercept your text messages. And this technology can be attached to a drone or it can be put in a briefcase or put in your pocket or, or whatever it may be. And, and there's antennas that make it larger and, and the network larger, for instance. But yeah, the technology exists to where we can listen to your phone call. And, and, and fake cell phone towers as well? Right, that, that is called mobile network spoofing. And what that is, is, is we can put a device in a vehicle or on a, if you're in the desert, for instance, and we know that, that the 10 is a major drug corridor, so that's where it becomes relevant. You can put a device on a drone, fly it overhead, and it can spoof a cell phone tower. So when your cell phone, it, it has to connect to a tower to essentially amplify the signal and then get on the network yes. to transmit the communication. Well, there's a period of time where your signal is going from your handset to that tower, as you know, everybody's kind of familiar with that. Well, imagine if you were able to fake that cell phone tower and make your phone think that you were, you know, that I was talking to you when in reality I'm talking over here. Yeah. And then it's transmitting back to the tower and then broadcasting out so you don't notice an interruption of the signal. That technology is open source. So you can learn about it online. So I'm not giving away any, any secrets here, but I'm not going to get into to specifics. But there are some interesting names associated with that technology. Well, there, there are some interesting legal questions as well. How, much, of, how much evidence can you use if you gather it by that uh, particular technique? Well, that's that's another good question. And I remember a law professor used to call about Wing Sung this, this case. It's called fruit of the poisonous tree, meaning if we take fruit from the poisonous tree, can we use that evidence against you? And the answer is no, but you can back in to the case different ways. And that's frequently how it's used. For instance, I just need the information that you're going to be X place at a certain time, and then I can make sure a police car passes you and pulls you over for a taillight violation, mm. for instance, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of how it's, it's used in that sense. And uh, so the device itself isn't important without software. So really this, the software that ciphers all this stuff is really critical too, and yes. that's the next generation. What about this license plate technology that also, I mean, license plate technology has kind of been out there for a while, reading license plates. Right. Now they're starting to read faces with the license plates? Yeah, there's facial recognition technology that can combine with license plate readers, and that combines with the cell phone spoofing and, and those sorts of things to where ultimately, uh, you know, the, the idea that you have any privacy in public, I think, is false. And I think that that's not subject necessarily to Fourth Amendment constitutional rights to, against search and seizure, for instance. Why, why don't you think so? Well, because, for instance, if, if you use a cell phone and you transmit a signal and you know that it goes to AT&T's tower, well, presumably at some point AT&T or Sprint or any one of the networks, you know, they have some access to that information and, and it's a permissible use to transmit it onward. Now, is it the same thing as a piece of mail? So when the post office gets your piece of mail, are they allowed to open it? Well, we know in certain circumstances they are, if you're sending drugs in the mail, for instance. Okay, now, there, now that begs the next question, which is probable cause and warrants, and, and judges typically oversee those sorts of things. One of the major issues has been law enforcement's use of certain devices, in particular what's called a stingray device, mm. or trigger fish, or, or harpoon devices, and there's some more that I'm not going to say. But their use of those devices to collect cell phone information is a step removed from even what AT&T does, which is just a transmitter or a distributor of the signal. They're actually storing and gathering that information in data centers, which you just talked about a data center, for instance. Right. And one of the uses for data centers is to store terabytes of this information. And yet, I mean, we've talked about this on the show as far as uh, court cases are concerned. The courts have kind of said you can't search cell phones if those are found in cars, correct? Well, that was a very, very, very recent case. Yes. It literally came out in the Ninth Circuit in December of 2014, so just a couple of months ago. And that was USV Camus, I believe it was. But uh, yeah, they found that a cell phone, if an officer picks it up and wants to search through it, if it's not incident to arrest or if it's not relevant to an active criminal act at that time, that it's not considered a container that can be searched in the vehicle. So that's good news, but the East Coast has been different. There's been what's called a split of authority legally. There have been, there have been courts that have said that, in fact, police can search your phone. 
And so now you have an issue that may in fact end up in front of the Supreme Court, and it probably should. So we basically have society and the law trying to catch up to technology and the courts trying to catch up to the law in the first place. That's right. And what's happening is some of these judges are issuing warrants just because the police tell them, oh, we're just going to do a pen register or a wiretap. And they don't understand that this is way beyond that because the law is a slow moving techn technological entity. Mm -hmm. And these judges ha frankly have no idea. I mean, what is a stingray? I mean, what, what is that device? and people don't really understand that. So last question, we've got about 30 seconds left. Are you concerned about your privacy? No, because I don't have an expectation of privacy with anything that's public. So... Sh I just simply don't expect it. You don't expect it, but right. even, though, even so, does it concern you? Well, I, it concerns me that the law hasn't caught up to the technology, absolutely, as an attorney and as a private citizen, absolutely. All right, great stuff. Good to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Time now to look behind the scenes at the Phoenix Zoo. That's where producer Christina Estes and photographer Steve Aaron recently learned about a program that pairs teenagers with animals. I really love the zoo. I've been here since I was little, and I love coming and seeing all the animals. These days, Anila Tynan does a lot more than just see the animals. So what we do in the morning is we might come in, and you're going to get all the poop out of the shavings and out of their stall. Anila is among more than 100 teens who volunteer at the Phoenix Zoo. It's really great to come, to be able to come on the weekend, to leave behind like school and the house and get here and just um, have fun with friends. I kind of view the zoo teen program as a bridging program where they can bridge through their teen years into their adult life. Robin Wilson runs carnivore. the program. You guys have any thoughts on that table and how we can make it better? Each volunteer begins as either a trail teen where they present animal artifacts and share information with guests. What? Can goats move fast? Yeah, they can run fast. Yeah. Our goats are kind of lazy though, so. Or they can start as a farm team, which involves a lot of cleaning. As a second year volunteer, Anila was able to become an equine team. I really have a passion for horses. I really like working with them. I like being around them. And also, um, it's a great stepping stone to get to um, even higher levels of the zoo team program like Animal Care Center, which is where you get to work alongside, hi pretty girl, alongside the veterinarians. I haven't picked up poop at all, <laughs> believe it or not. Instead, Christian Topete picks up a lot of worms. He volunteers in the kitchen where they scoop more than 44,000 mealworms every month. And our birds one string gets two cups of worms. It's probably the most amount that we distribute. As a member of the nutritional services team, Christian helps prepare 500 diets for 1,400 animals. So this, since this is my third year, I was able to apply for this and I did the interview and it scared me. <laughs> I was freaking out the whole time, but I finally made it. I got the call and they told me that, you know, they were going to accept me into the program and I felt like I won the lottery, honestly. But this lottery winner still had to prove himself by taking a test on nutrition, personal hygiene, and food safety. So once I passed that, they asked me, you know, what, what's your experience with knives? And I, at the time, I had no experience with knives at all. Look at him now. Besides mastering knives, brooms, and rakes, zoo teens are exposed to networking, meetings, and even hiring decisions. I ran an interview um, alongside my supervisor and I got to see what it's like on the other side of the table. That's another huge key element to the Zucine program as I encourage the kids to develop relationships not just with myself but with the other 
uh, staff members here at the Phoenix Zoo so that they can get those letters of recommendation or a reference that they can um, have doors open for them. A whole world has opened for Christian since he took the first step as a 14-year-old trail team. It helped me grow as a person because I was really shy talking to people and I was not a good public speaker whatsoever. So, I mean, just fighting to get the words out was really hard for me and now I'm comfortable with talking to any guest that comes up to me and that helped me. Not every teen will spend their lives working at a zoo. <laughs> But everyone <laughs> will remember their time as a zoo team. The program is open to students 14 to 17 years of age. Applications are accepted from March through May. You can find out more at phoenixzoo.org. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's a journalist's roundtable. We'll discuss a lawsuit targeting the state's foster care system. And we'll look at a bill that bans texting while driving. That's Friday on the journalist's roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.